Income tax 2023-2024. Maker's depreciation general asset accounts. Get ready and some coffee because if taxes were an animal, the government would definitely be a leech. Ew, get it off. We're trying, we're trying, but if you rip the thing off too hard, it might tear your face off. So we have to be, we have to be careful. Most of this, first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six pack shirts. A must have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle, always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six pack stomach muscle vibe, man. You know, that CPA six pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. Yeah, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six pack like shape, which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. A and yes, I know six pack isn't spelled right, but three letters is more efficient than four. So I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. This information can be found in publication 946, how to depreciate property, section 179, deduction, special depreciation allowance, makers, listed property, and more tax year 2023, which you could find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here having, though, income minus deductions resulting in taxable income. The sole proprietorship schedule C rolling into line one income of our formula. Remember, in the schedule C itself, basically an income statement, having business income minus business expenses resulting in, in essence, net business income, which is what rolls in from the Schedule C to line one income of the formula. This formula outlining the calculation for the Form 1040, of which this is the first page where the Schedule C ultimately rolls into line eight, additional income from Schedule 1. This is the Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments to income part one, Schedule C rolling into line three, business income or loss. This is the Schedule C, profit or loss from business, having an income statement format, income minus expenses, the expenses is what we're focusing in on now, some expenses being more difficult than others, such as the calculation of depreciation where, as we have seen from prior presentations, even if using the cash-based system, the tax code may force us to do an accrual thing. For example, if we were to purchase a $10,000 piece of equipment, we would like to just expense it in the time of purchase because one, that's the easiest thing to do. And two, that would give us the largest amount of expense or deduction in as soon as a time frame as we can. But the IRS will most likely not allow us to do that. Instead, forcing us to put it on the books as an asset which is difficult because we have no balance sheet here. We only have a profit and loss, meaning we might have separate depreciation schedules giving us the asset account of a balance sheet account of the asset account uh, for the equipment and the related uh, contra asset account of accumulated depreciation, as well as calculate the current year expense in the form of depreciation. Remembering though, that the IRS might allow us an upfront depreciation using a 179 deduction or special depreciation, allowing us possibly up to the full amount of the $10,000 in our example, not in the form of equipment expense, but in the form of depreciation expense, leading to the question of why didn't you just let me use the cash basis system in the first place? 
why do I have to deal with these depreciation schedules at all? And part of that is, of course, that the IRS tax code is borrowing from generally accepted accounting principles and then doing funny things based on politics, lobbying, trying to stimulate the economy, and so on and so forth. The 179 deduction, special depreciation, are the funny things that you would think would change over time as there are changes in politics and the business environment. You would think that the maker's depreciation, which has been our major focus of concentration lately, would be more stable because it is basically based on the, the, the more bedrock of fundamental generally accepted accounting principles. Okay, keeping that in mind, we're now going to look at how do you use general asset accounts. So to make it easier to figure maker's depreciation, you can group separate properties into one or more general asset accounts we can call GAAs. So as uh, you can then depreciate all the properties in each account as a single item of property. Now, as we do this, I just want to point out the importance of keeping nice and neat depreciation schedules and making sure that you're not only thinking about the calculation in the current period, possibly when you buy the property, but also what's going to happen over time when you dispose of the property. So in other words, typically we want to have our depreciation schedules labeling out, listing out each individual piece of property as best we can and having that list of property be able to tie into the actual physical thing that we have uh, in our business. So for example, if we purchased five forklifts, then I would like to know the exact number, license plate or whatever number of each forklift, put that into the description on the depreciable property so that when I sell the forklift, I know which forklift uh, was sold. If, I, if I'm not specific like that, for example, if I just put five line items that say forklift, then I'm not going to be able to identify the single forklift that I sold at the end of, of the process. So we want to be able to identify them as, as easily as possible. That's the general rule. Also, if I put the forklifts on there as one line item that includes all five forklifts, then that might still be something that I can get the same calculation of the depreciation in the year of purchase. However, you can see that it could lead to problems when I dispose of the forklifts because now I'm disposing of one item that, that was put on the, on the depreciation schedules as one line item when really it's one of five line items which is going to make the disposition more difficult. So as we go through this point, I just as this part, I just want to point out that you want the depreciation schedules as neat as possible and you're only going to know if it's neat at the point in time when things get get uh, messy, meaning when you sell things. All right. So property you cannot include so you cannot include property in a GAA if you use it in both a personal activity and a trade or business. So we're trying to group these into the, the GAAA, which as we said, general asset accounts. But when we have situations where it's both personal and business, as we saw in the past, then we're going to have to do that allocation and you may not be able to put it in the GAA in that case or for production of income in the year in which you first placed it in service. So if property you include in a GAA is later used in a personal activity, see terminating the GAA. So that could be somewhat of an issue because now you've got it, these things grouped together and part of the property that is now grouped together is, is now being used partially personally and you would think that's going to be an issue because now you have to break up the GAA in order to take the partial depreciation, you would think. Property generating foreign source income. For information on the GAA treatment of property that generates foreign source income, you could see section 1.168I1C12 and uh, F of the regulations. Change in use. So special rules apply to figuring depreciation for property in a GGAA, -A, G -A -A, for which uh, the use changes during the tax year. So examples include a change in use resulting in a shorter recovery period and or more accelerated depreciation method or a change in use resulting in a longer recovery 
period and or less accelerated depreciation method. In other words, we've got these items grouped together now uh, and we want consistency. So if everything is consistent in the tax code and we just depreciate it over its useful life, everything should be okay, hopefully. But if we have changes where we have to change, in essence, the calculation, that could cause a problem, especially if only one of the items within the group of items is going to have a change. If we sell one of the items in the group of the item, that might cause a problem. If one of the items in the group of the items uh, becomes partially personal use, uh, then again, you can see why that might cause a problem. See section 1.168 I-1H and 1.168I-4 of the regulations in that case. Grouping property. So each GAA must include only property you placed in service in the same tax year and that has the following in common. So if we're going to be grouping the properties together, you would think, of course, you're grouping things that happened in the same tax year because... They, they need to have the same schedule of depreciation basically applied to them generally. So they're going to have uh, things in common, the recovery period. So you would think they would be of a sim the same class, which would have the same recovery period, so that if we grouped them together and basically depreciated them as though they were one item, we would come up with, in essence, the same result as though we took all of the items and applied the same depreciation concepts to them. So depreciation method, meaning like double declining method would be standard for makers, uh, for example, or the straight line if we elect the straight line and the convention, which means the mid-month, mid-year, half-year convention and so on and so forth. If these things are the same, you would expect then that for those items, if I put five items on individually, then I should come up to the same answer in terms of depreciation than if I grouped them together and basically depreciated them as one line item. That's what's given us possibly the capacity for this GAA grouping. So the following rules also apply when you, when you establish a GAA, mid-quarter convention. Property subject to the mid-quarter convention can only be grouped into a GAA with property placed in service in the same quarter of uh, the tax year. So mid-quarter convention comes up when we're forced to go from the default of that half-year convention to the mid-quarter convention. So mid-month convention. So property subject to mid-month convention can only be grouped into GAA with property placed in service in the same month of the tax year. Now the mid-month convention, you might expect this would be less likely that you're going to do this because you're talking about real estate typically when you're talking about property subject to the mid-month uh, uh, convention. So it's a much more restricted because it has to be in the same month in that case. Passenger automobiles. Passenger automobiles subject to the limits on passenger automobile depreciation must be grouped into a, a separate GAA. So we, we will talk possibly a more later about automobiles, which are going to be subject to special rules, possibly, because, again, the IRS is going to be skeptical about automobiles because of people buying really nice automobiles and then riding off the, the automobile. That's what they're going to be suspicious of. So there might be different rules for the passenger automobiles than to other property, which means that, again, you would think you would have to group the things that are going to be depreciated the same uh, together so that the end result of the grouping being depreciated as one line item would basically give you the same result as though you put multiple line items and depreciating them using the same methods, but for multiple line items. Figuring depreciation for a GAA. After you have set up a GAA, you generally figure the maker's depreciation for it by using the applicable depreciation method, recovery period, and convention for the property in the GAA. So you would think, in theory, it would be easier because basically now you have everything uh, grouped together in one place and you would just basically depreciate that group using that the, what you would know about that group, which should all be the same, right, which is the recovery period and the convention and the method that is going to be used. Now, again, I uh, noticed that we with the software these days, you could see how this calculation would be 
possibly very beneficial, especially the more manual your calculations are going to be. As we have the online uh, computer systems helping us out with these calculations, then you've got to weigh out how beneficial is it for the simplification to look at these groupings of the GAA groupings versus allowing the software to do the calculations on a line by line item, which again, could make it a little bit easier to deal with issues where we have a change in the accounting uh, rules or the depreciation time frame for whatever reason and or when we sell one piece of property out of the group of the property, which is the thing that's most likely to happen. Uh, uh, you know, it's likely that these groupings, either we depreciate them for their whole useful life and everything goes smoothly, no problem. But if we dispose of part of the grouping, that's when you would think that uh, it could cause kind of an, an issue in terms of recalculating. So for each GAA, record the depreciation allowance in a separate depreciation reserve account. Let's look at an example. So uh, make, make and sell a calendar year corporation set up a GAA for 10 machines. The machines cost a total of $10,000 and were placed in service in June 2023. One of the machines cost $8,200 and the rest cost a total of $1,800. So notice they weren't all like exactly the same thing, but they all have the same category with regards to the calculation of depreciation generally. And therefore, although they don't have the same dollar amount, if we put them all on the books separately and calculated them using the same method and recovery period and so on, you would think that you might come up with the same result as though you put them on there in essence as a grouping, which is in essence kind of calculating as though it was one line item. So this GAA is depreciable under the 200% declining balance method with a five-year recovery period and half-year convention. Make and sell did not claim the section 179 deduction. So we're removing that from our example to make it uh, to focus on makers on the machines and the machines did not qualify for special depreciation. So the depreciation allowance for 2023 is 2000, which is just the 10,000 total times the 40% divided by two because it's a half year convention. In other words, the basic calculation as though it was just one piece of property that you purchased for 10,000 instead of calculating 10 different pieces of property, which is simplifying the calculation. But again, the question here is also, that makes the depreciation schedules possibly cleaner and whatnot easier to calculate upfront. But it also means that, that you have 10 pieces of equipment and if that group gets broken up for whatever reason, such as you dispose or sell one of them or it gets destroyed or stolen or something, then, then that could mess up your grouping of depreciation going forward. All right, so the depreciation uh, reserve account is 2000. So passenger automobiles, to figure depreciation on a passenger automobiles in a GAA, apply the deduction limits discussed in chapter five under do passenger automobile limits apply. So same kind of concept, you got to put all the passenger automobiles together, which now have this added restriction of that might be applied to passenger automobiles, which is why the group needs to be consistent, have the same kind of things applied to it, including these restrictions to be in the group. So multiply the amount determined using these limits by the number of automobiles originally included in the account, reduced by the total number of automobiles removed from the GAA, and... Uh, as discussed under terminating GAA treatment, which we'll see later. Disposing of GAA property. Okay, here we go. When you dispose of a property included in a GAA, the following rules generally apply. Neither the unadjusted depreciable basis defined later, nor the depreciation reserve account of the GAA is affected. You continue to depreciate the account as if the, dis the disposition had not occurred. The property is treated as having an adjusted basis of zero, so you cannot uh, realize a loss on the disposition. So if the property is transferred uh, to a supplies, scrap, or similar account, its basis is that uh, in that account is zero. So any amount realized on the disposition is treated as, as uh, ordinary income up to the limit discussed later under treatment uh, of amount realized. 
So notice what we have here. So now we have this grouping of the GAA. We dispose of the property. Now, normally when we dispose of the property, what's going to happen? Well, if it was one line item on the depreciation schedule, I would have to see if it has been fully depreciated or not. Meaning, has the full useful life ended and now the property uh, is basically has a basis of zero. If the basis is zero and I sell it or I get some, you know, I sell it or get some money for the scrap or something, I might have a gain resulting uh, from from the sale. But if there's any basis that is left uh, in the property, then I'm going to have to take the sales price minus the adjusted basis of the property. And I could end up then generally uh, with a loss. In that case, losses are typically kind of good uh, for for ta taxes. So here, if we group these things together, that's going to make it difficult for us to dispose of one piece of the group. So notice what it's saying here is that neither the unadjusted depreciation basis defined later nor the depreciation reserve account of the GAA is affected. So, so you continue to depreciate the account as if the disposition had not occurred, meaning we're just going to continue on with our way here and say we're still going to take the deduction and we're going to allocate the cost over the useful life as opposed to basically uh, reducing the amount of gain or possibly taking the loss at the point uh, in time of sale. So that simplifies our, our depreciation you know, calculation, but it means that in some cases, we, if there were still basis left, we might not be able to utilize that basis at the point in time that we dispose of the property. So there's pros and cons on that. So the property is treated as having an adjusted basis of zero. So we treat it as though it was fully uh, depreciated, meaning it had, so whatever sales price we would have gotten for it, we would have uh, a gain on it. Even if it wasn't fully depreciated, we're still going to get the benefit of the cost, but instead of calculating it at the sales price, sales price minus the adjusted basis, we're going to get it just when the normal depreciation happens over the useful life of the property, even though we sold it. Now, then we have this issue of, well, that could result in a gain. It's like, okay, well, I have a gain. It's just a timing difference between the gain and when I get the expenses that would have resulted from the depreciation. Uh, but then the gain, the question is, should the gain be taxed at ordinary income or capital gain? So, right. So you, so you cannot realize a loss on the disposition because you don't have any, you're, you're not going to have any basis. So it's impossible to calculate a loss sales price minus the cost. If the cost was higher, you would have a loss, but you can't have the cost being higher because we're going to say that it's, it's zero. So you're always going to have a gain. So if the property is transferred to a supplies scrap or similar account, its basis in that account is zero. So if you transfer it to scrap, then then you're still kind of disposing of it or transferring it, but you're not going to be adjusting the basis over there because it's locked into this depreciation group, which we're just going to continue depreciating. So any amount realized on the disposition is treated as ordinary income up to the limit discussed later under treatment of amount realized. However, these rules do not apply to any disposition of disposition described later under terminating GAA treatment. Disposition. Property in a GAA is considered disposed of when you do any of the following. Permanently withdraw it from use in your trade or business or from the production of income. Transfer it to a supplies, scrap, or similar account. Sell, exchange, retire, physically abandon, or destroy it. So in other words, at, you know, we have to, either, if we sell the, the property or we dispose of the property, typically we're going to have to take those off of our depreciation schedules, you know, at some point in time. When we take them off of the depreciation schedules, that'll clean up our depreciation schedules. But with these groupings, the general idea would be that we're still just going to continue to depreciate it until the depreciation basically is at zero per the group, basically. So treatment of amount realized. When you use, when you dispose of property in a GAA, you must recognize any amount realized from the disposition as ordinary income up to a limit. The limit is the adjusted depreciable basis of the GAA plus any expense, uh, expense costs 
for property in the GAA that are subject to recapture as depreciation, not including any expense costs for property that you removed from the GAA under the rules discussed later under terminating GAA treatment minus any amount previously recognized as ordinary income upon the disposition of uh, other property from the GAA. Now, this gets messy, right? What, how, what is going on here? Well, the, the general idea is that if I, ha if I have the equipment that I purchased, when I'm getting the expense of that equipment, I, I take that in the form of the depreciation and, and the depreciation is an expense, which usually gives me a benefit in accordance with ordinary income benefits. When I sell the property, if it was property, it might usually you would think be subject to capital gains rates, which are favorable rates. However, usually I'm not going to sell the property for more than I purchased it for. In other words, if I buy most equipment like a, like a forklift or something, it declines in value over time. Only things like real estate are things that are really going to increase possibly in value. So normal equipment is going to decline in value generally. And if I sell it for, if I sell it and I have a gain, then the, the gain is usually not going to be a gain that's higher than the amount I purchased it for. I have a gain because the amount I received is higher than basically the uh, adjusted basis. And so if I was allowed, if I was allowed to, to take the gain at, uh, at, a favorable rate, capital gains rates, you would think that wouldn't really be fair given the fact that the only reason I have a gain is because I over depreciated the property and I got a deduction at ordinary income rates. So generally when this happens, the general idea would be, you know, it's the same concept when we talked about like recapture or some in prior presentations on the sale of equipment would generally be the gain up to the point in time of the original cost you would think would be taxed at ordinary income because you got a deduction at ordinary income. And if you sold it for greater than the purchase price, that's when you might have that favorable capital gains, which most likely isn't gonna happen for anything except for like real estate, which is the only thing that usually goes up in value when you're talking about business stuff, unless it's like a painting or you know like collectibles or something. So unadjusted depreciable basis. The unadjusted depreciable basis of a GAA is the total of the unadjusted depreciable basis of all the property in the GAA. The unadjusted depreciable basis of an item of property in a GAA is the amount you would use to figure gain or loss on its sale, but figured without reducing the original basis by any depreci depreciation allowed or allowable in earlier years. In other words, the unadjusted depreciable basis it, we're kind of treating this all this property as though it was one line item. The unadjusted depreciable basis is basically the cost of it, in essence, not being reduced by the depreciation. The adjusted basis is the basis that is still left after having taken into consideration the amount of, of the benefit, the potential energy that we have already consumed in the form of depreciation, the book value in essence. So however, you do reduce your original basis by other amounts, including uh, any amortized deduction, section 179 deduction, special depreciation. In other words, if I bought the, if I bought like five items and they add up to $10,000, then I put it on the books as though it was one $10,000 item. If it was subject to 179 deduction, I would reduce it by whatever the 179 or special depreciation that I get. Let's say it was 8,000. That means that the, de that the depreciable basis for makers purposes is the 2,000, which we would still call the unadjusted uh, depreciation because it's not being adjusted for makers depreciation, but only by the 179. All right, expense costs. Expense costs that are subject to recapture as depreciation include the following. The section 179 deduction amortization deductions for the following uh, pollution control facilities removal of barriers for elderly and disabled uh, tartary injunctions uh, tertiary injunctions uh, re re reforestation expenses okay so these are going to be ex items that remember if you sold the property and you had like a gain on it 
then 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 that gain might be taxed say for like ordinary income purposes let's look at an example the facts are the same in the example under figuring depreciation for GAA earlier so in February 2024 make and sell sells the machine that cost $8,200 to an unrelated person for $9,000 so notice they sold it for greater than what they purchased it for that's unusual for a machine right because you usually the machines go down in value although if you keep a good upkeep on it and so on it's possible for to sell it for greater than the price of of the machine so you would think then that the amount of the nine thousand minus the original price if it was a you know a normal just one asset item would be the amount possibly subject to the more favorable rates of ordinary income and the amount of the 8,200 that was depreciated is the part of the gain that might be subject then to the ordinary income rates. That would be the general idea, right? So the machine is treated as having an adjusted basis of zero. Why? Because again, it's grouped, it's grouped together with those other, with the other things. So we're just gonna keep depreciating it and allocating the cost of the 8,200 over its useful life as opposed to taking the sales price 9,000 minus the adjusted basis. So we would still get the same to the end result. It would just be a timing difference because either I take the, 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 the unallocated costs at the time I sold it and reduce the amount of gain at that point in time, or I just keep on taking the depreciation expense continued on to the useful life until that 8,200 is totally expired. So it's just a timing difference in that case. But then we also have this problem of should the gain be subject to ordinary income or should it be subject to capital gains? And again, you would think here that normally it would be subject to ordinary incomes because you're depreciating it at ordinary income rates. But this one has part of the gain that's higher than the actual sales price. Okay, so on its 2024 tax return, make and sell recognizes the $9,000 amount realized as ordinary income because it is not more than the GAA's unadjusted depreciable basis of 10,000 plus any expenses cost, for example, section uh, 179 deduction for property in GAA zero minus any amounts previously recognized as ordinary income because of the disposition of other property from the GAA. The unadjusted depreciable basis of uh, basis and depreciation reserve of GGAA are not affected by the sale of the machine. The depreciation allowance for the GAA in 2024 is 3,200. So notice what's happening here. If we put all of these items on the books one at a time, then this particular machine, when we sold it, you would think that you might have part of the gain subject to the more favorable capital gains rates, given the fact that you sold it for more than you purchased it. But because it's inside the GAA and mixed together with the total cost of the 10,000, it's all going to be cal it's all going to be be subject to ordinary income rates and of course again you're not taking the any 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 unallocated basis at the point of sale but rather expensing it over time so again it's sim more simplified to use the GAA in that case but you could ha lose some benefits from it than if you put it on the books at one at a time however again it's not totally likely that you're going to sell the property for something higher than you purchased it for so that might not be ad as much of an issue unless you're dealing with real estate number one uh, but number two it could be it could be the case that you sell the property before it's been fully depreciated and in that case you're not getting the benefit of the unadjusted basis as early as you otherwise would if you put all the property on the books one at a time instead of as a group example two Assume the same facts as in example one. In June 2025, make and sell sells seven machines to an unrelated person for a total of $1,100. The machines are treated as having an adjusted basis of zero. On its 2025 tax return, make and sell recovers 1,000 as ordinary income. This is the GAA's adjust, uh, unadjusted depreciable basis, 10,000 plus the expenses costs zero, minus the amount previously recognized as ordinary income, 
uh, 9,000. The remaining amount realized, 100, which is the 1,100 minus the 1,000, is section 1031 gain discussed in chapter 3 of publication 544. The unadjusted depreciable basis and depreciation reserve of the GAA are not affected by the disposition of the machine. The depreciation allowance for the GAA is in 2025 is the 1920 which is the 10,000 minus the 5200 minus the double declining rate of the 40%. All right, terminating GAA treatment. You must remove the following property from a GAA. So now it's grouped together. What if is there what if we are terminating removing the GAA the grouping treatment? Property held by a partnership that terminates under section 708B1, property you dispose of in a non-recognition non transaction or an abusive transaction, property you dispose of in a qualifying disposition or in a disposition of all the property in the GAA if you choose to terminate GAA treatment, property you dispose of in a like-kind exchange or an involuntary conversion, property you change to personal use. So property for which you must recapture any allowable credit or deduction, such as the investment credit, the credit for qualified electric vehicles, the credit for alternative fuel vehicle refueling property, the section 179 deduction, or the deduction for clean fuel vehicles and clean fuel vehicle refueling property placed in service before 2006. All right, so if you remove property from a GAA, you must make the following adjustments. Reduce the unadjusted depreciable basis of the GAA by the unadjusted depreciable basis of the property as of the first day of the tax year in which the dis disposition change in use, partnership uh, te technical termination or recapture event occurs. Uh, you can use any reasonable method that is consistently applied to determine the unadjusted depreciable basis of the property you remove from a GAA. So you can see this gets somewhat complex, right? Because now this would be the, a similar kind of situation as though you put a multiple line items into one line item and then you sold one of those line items, right? If they were grouped in a GAA, they're basically saying, usually when you sell it, we're just going to keep depreciating it as normal. But if you did have to pull one line item out, terminating that part of the GAA, you're gonna to have to figure out the adjusted basis of the point of the part that you're gonna pull out. So reduce the depreciation reserve account by the depreciable allowance or allow or allowable for property computed in the same way as computed for the GAA as of the end of the tax year immediately preceding the year in which the disposition change in use or recapture event occurs. So non-recognition transactions, if you dispose of a GAA property in a non-recognition transaction, you must remove it from the GAA. The following are non-recognition transactions the receipt of one corporation of property distributed to a complete liquidation of another corporation, the transfer of property to a corporation solely in exchange for stock in that corporation if the transfer is in control of the corporation immediately after the exchange, the transfer of property by a corporation that is a party to a a uh, reorganization in exchange solely for stock and securities in another corporation that is also a party to the reorganization, the contribution of property to a partnership in exchange for an interest in the partnership, the distribution of property, including money from a partnership to a partner. So any transaction between members of the same uh, affiliated group during any year for which group makes a consolidated return. So rules for recipient transferee. So the recipient of the property, the person to whom it is transferred, must include your uh, transferor's adjusted basis in the property in a GAA. So obviously the basis is going to be that, that amount that we can call the potential energy that is now going to be transferred, right? So that's going to be the, the amount that potentially could have a tax benefit to 
uh, the individual who has the basis of the property. If you transferred either all of the property, the last item of property, or the remaining portion of the last item of property in a GAA, the recipient's basis in the property is the, is the rest of the following. The adjusted depreciable basis of the GAA as of the beginning of, the, of, the, of your tax year in which the transaction takes place minus the depreciation allowable to you for the year of the transfer. So for this purpose, the adjusted depreciable basis of a GAA is the unadjusted depreciation basis of the GAA minus any depreciation allowed or allowable for the GAA. Abusive transactions. If you dispose of GAA property in an abusive transaction, you must remove it from the GAA. A disposition is an abusive transaction if it is not a recognition transaction described earlier or a like-kind exchange or involuntary conversion. And a main purpose for the disposition is to get a tax benefit or a result that would not be available without the use of a GAA meaning in essence you're abusing the GAA in some reason for in a way that it wasn't designed to be used for which is basically simplification so examples of abusive transactions include the following a transaction with a main purpose of shifting income or deductions among taxpayers in a way that would not be possible without choosing to use a GAA to take advantage of deferring effect effective tax rates so now we're manipulating the, the tax rates with the use of a GAA, which was not its intention. A choice to use a GAA with a main purpose of disposing of property from the GAA so that you can use an, expir an expiring net operating loss or credit. For example, if you have a net operating loss carryover or a credit carryover, the following transactions will be considered abusive transactions unless there is a strong evidence to the contrary, a transfer of GAA property to a related person, a transfer of GAA property under an agreement where the property continues to be used or is available for you use by you. Figuring gain or loss. You must determine the gain, loss, or other deduction due to an abusive transaction by taking into account the property's adjusted basis. So now you have the issue where they kind of eliminated normally with a GAA by just continuing to depreciate at the point of disposition. But now you have to figure out what the adjusted basis is so that you can properly calculate the gain or loss in this case. The adjusted basis of property at the time of disposition is the result of the following. The unadjusted depreciable basis of the property minus the depreciation allowed or allowable for the property figured by using the depreciation method, recovery period, and convention that applies to the GAA in which the property was included. If there is a gain, the amount subject to recapture as ordinary income is the smaller of the following. So now we have a situation where we might have a gain, which you would think would be subject to the ordinary income, but you would think that, that the, if it was a gain over and above the cost, you might have the more favorable rates at that point of the capital gains rates. Uh, so, so the depreciation allowance or allowable for the property, including any expensed cost, such as section 179 deduction or the special depreciation allowance for the property, the result of the following, the original unadjusted depreciable basis of the GAA plus for, plus for section 1245 property originally included in the GAA, any expense cost minus the total gain previously recognized as ordinary income on the disposition of property from the GAA. Qualified dispositions. If you dispose of a GAA property in a qualified disposition, you can choose to remove the property from the GAA. A qualified disposition is one that does not involve all the property or the last item of property remaining in a GAA and that is described by any of the following. 
a disposition that is direct result of fire, storm, shipwreck, or other casualty or theft, a charitable contribution for which a deduction is allowed, a disposition that is a direct result of a secession, termination, or disposition of a business, manufacturing, or other income producing process, operation, facility, plant, or other unit other than by transfer to a supplies, scrap, or similar account, a non-taxable transaction other than a non-recognition transaction described earlier, a like-kind exchange or involuntary conversion, a technical termination of a partnership or a transaction that is non-taxable only because it is a disposition from a GAA. Electing to use a GAA. An election to include property in a GAA is made separately by each owner of the property. This means that an election to include property in a GAA must be made by each member of a consolidated group and at the partnership or S corporation level and not by each partner or shareholder separately. So if it was on a separate flow through return like a partnership return or S corporation return has to be made on that level. How to make the election? Make the election by completing line 18 of form 4562. When to make the election? You must make the election on a timely file tax return, including extension for the year in which you place in service the property included in the GAA. However, if you timely file your return for the year without making the election, you can still make the election by filing an amended return within six months of the due date of the return. That includes the extensions. Attach the election to the amended return and write, quote, filed pursuant to section 301.9100-2 on the election statement. 